text verse comes from verse 12. In a loud voice they were singing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Brothers and sisters, in chapter 4, the Apostle John described to us the throne room with God sitting on his throne. And John saw and heard many heavenly sights and sounds. And as I've already said, the scene continues into this new chapter 5. And now he sees a seven-sealed scroll in God's right hand. He hears pronouncements and he sees Christ receiving that scroll out of God's right hand. And he hears universal applause. Let us consider the scroll. But secondly, the Savior. And thirdly, the singing. These three points naturally come out of this chapter. Let's first consider the scroll. John saw a scroll in God's right hand. This probably was a rolled up paper made of something like papyrus or parchment. And this was very well known in those days and very well known to John. This scroll in the right hand of God symbolizes God's power, His sovereignty. And the scroll symbolizes the record of God's plans for the future of this world and of the entire universe. And not only for a certain part of time, but for all the ages and right into eternity. But this scroll was sealed with seven seals. The seven seals signify the hidden nature of the scrolls, the hidden nature of God's plans. Nobody can read it. Only someone who is worthy to read it and to open the various seals. John could see something very unusual. And that was that this scroll was written on, on both sides. He could not read what was written, but he could see that it contained writing on both sides. Something completely unusual. Symbolizing that it was God's complete plan on the front and on the back. Nothing else could or should be added. A search took place for one who was worthy to open the scroll and to break the seals. In verse 2 of chapter 5, John draws our attention to a mighty angel. Other translations talk about a strong angel calling out in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and to open the scroll? This angel acts at a very decisive moment in all history, in the unfolding of history before us. But we do not even know his name because his name is not even given. All that we know is he was a mighty angel. And loudly he challenged everyone in creation to come forward if they thought that they were worthy to open the scroll and break the seals and to carry out whatever is written inside that scroll. Of course, God can read 
And God can open the scroll because he is a sovereign God. But God is not going to do that. In his all wisdom, he decided not to do it himself, but to give it to someone else to do. Verse 3 says, But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. The Jews visualized the universe consisting of three parts. The heaven, where the heavenly beings live, together with God. The earth, where human beings and animals and fish and birds live. And then the under earth, where the spirits live. That was their vision of the universe. Now John says, nobody in the whole universe, in the whole creation, could open the scroll or even peep inside it. No angel, no human being, no animal, no devil, no living or dead creature was worthy to open that scroll and break the seals. No one. He called out in a very loud voice so that everyone in creation could hear this challenge. No one responded. No one was worthy to open that scroll. And this made John weep and weep. He realized that history could not develop or conclude or come to its fullness unless someone may open and can open that scroll and read its contents and carry out its contents. In Revelation 4 verse 1, the previous chapter, Jesus said to John, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. So John, in the spirit, went up to heaven. He went through that open door, and he saw the throne of God, with God sitting on that throne. And he had all sorts of heavenly sights, and he heard all sorts of heavenly sounds, and naturally, his expectation must have grown. He wanted to see and hear more and more. But now, everything ground to a standstill. Because there was nobody worthy to open the scroll. What a disappointment. He expected to see God's final plans, but now he can't see it. Even though Jesus Christ called him up and said that he would show him. And then one of the elders said to him, do not weep. See, listen to that word, see, see. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Verse 5. It was an elder, not an angel, not a mighty angel, an elder who said this to him. He pointed John towards Jesus who worked salvation for everyone. The elder represents the church, the saints who were saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. That elder represents you and me in heaven. The angels did not need salvation. 
because the angels did not fall. Human beings needed that salvation. And that elder knew that God is almighty and that Jesus Christ had paid the price that he purchased salvation with his dear blood. And he is worthy to open that scroll and to break the seals to see what is inside. In effect, that elder said to him, stop weeping, man. Open your eyes. See. See. With the word see, the elder lets John see Jesus Christ and his triumph. Open your eyes, man. He has already worked your salvation. Although no creature can open the scroll, there is someone who can do it, who is worthy to do it. He, the elder said, is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the root of David, and he has triumphed. A lion is a symbol of power. The last book of the Bible refers back to the first book of the Bible, Genesis. Blessing his sons, Jacob said of his son Judah that he was a lion's cub. And he said the scepter, the scepter of a king, the scepter would not depart from him and the nations would obey him there already in the very first book of the bible there was a prophecy by jacob of the lion of the tribe of judah who will one day be the king and you can read about that in genesis 49 verse 1 and also verses 9 and 10. The elder now says to John that this prophecy, the Genesis prophecy, had come to fruition, had been fulfilled. The lion of the tribe of Judah has triumphed, as predicted, as prophesied. The elder calls him the Lion of Judah, indicating the Messiah. And the Jews, all the centuries, had that expectation of the Messiah, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, coming. But the elder also said, this Lion of the tribe of Judah is also the root of David. The prophets Jeremiah and Isaiah, they talked about the root of David. You can read about that in Isaiah 11 verse 1 to 3 and Jeremiah 23 verse 5. The Jews expected the Messiah to come from the offspring, the seed of David. And the very first verse of the New Testament Matthew 1, verse 1, says, Jesus is the Messiah, the son of David. Matthew 1, verse 1. The very first verse of the New Testament. And even Jesus' earthly father, Joseph, came from the offspring of David. So he truly is the son of David. So Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah and he is the root of David. He is the Messiah. And then in Revelation 22 verse 16, the very last chapter of the Bible, Jesus himself calls himself the root and the offspring of David. 
the lion has triumphed. And that is why he has the power and the authority to take that scroll and to open the seals because he has triumphed. And then a shock because the next thing that he saw was not a lion but a lamb. A lamb. A slain lamb. A slaughtered lamb. He writes, Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. And this brings us from the scroll to the Savior. The Savior is the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. But he's also a lamb, a slain lamb. What a paradox, what a contradiction. How could it be possible that a lion could at the same time be a lamb? Because the lion was a sacrificed lamb. He sacrificed himself and he triumphed through that sacrifice on the cross. In the Bible, a lamb was used as a sacrifice for sin. In the Old Testament, God instituted the Passover. The Israelites had to slaughter a lamb and then they had to take the blood of the lamb and strike it against the sides and the top of their doorposts in the houses where they were instructed to eat the lamb on the day just before they exited Egypt. And that was before the tenth plague, the death of the firstborns in Egypt. And God said that he would pass over the houses of the Israelites where he sees the blood on the doorposts. He would pass over and he would not strike death for the firstborns in that house. So God passed over the Israelites. And that is why this sacrifice is known as the Passover. He passed over those houses. That's in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Christ is our Passover lamb. Whenever God the Father sees Jesus Christ and his blood, he passes over the person who places his faith in that blood. He passes you and I over when he sees that you have placed your trust in the sacrifice of Jesus there on the cross. In 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7 we read that Paul wrote that Christ is our Passover lamb because he has been sacrificed for us. When John the Baptist, not the John who is um, at stake at, uh, in Revelation, but John the Baptist, who was eventually beheaded, when he saw Jesus the very first time, some 60 years previously, he said, There, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The sacrificial lamb. Christ paid for sin, brothers and sisters, through that sacrifice on the cross. He conquered Satan and he conquered death when he rose from the grave. And when he ascended to heaven, he became the Almighty the ruler of the universe. He is the lion 
says this elder. He is the ruler. But he was also the sacrifice for sin. This lion lamb has triumphed. The lamb that John saw in heaven did not lie down. He was no longer slaughtered. Listen to what he writes. He says, it looked as if it had been slain. In other words, he was now standing. And do you know where he was standing? He was standing in the center of the throne. He was the center point of the throne. Isn't that also the name of this forum? The center point Christian forum. And the lamb was encircled by the four living creatures and the 24 elders. And John wrote down to us that he had seven horns. A horn is a symbol of power. And the number seven is the number of perfection. In other words, he has perfect power. That is the symbol. In other words, this refers to the omnipotence of God. Say Almach. He is the Almighty. But John also saw that this lamb had seven eyes. And he said that these eyes are the seven spirits of God that he sent out into the earth. This signifies the perfect Holy Spirit. Seven and the seven spirits. The perfect Holy Spirit was in this lamb. It was not just an ordinary lamb. It was the root of David. He was full of the Holy Spirit. He is fully God. And this lion lamb then stepped forward and boldly took that scroll from God's right hand. That powerful hand. And where God the Father held that scroll in his right hand previously, it signified his control of everything, his sovereignty, his power. And now the Father hands over the scroll to the Lamb. His son, he now officially carries over, transfers, assigns his power to his son. And now the son has full mandate, full power to govern. The lamb took that scroll. And then all heaven broke loose. In songs of praise. Let's consider the third point, namely the singing. The four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb in worship and praise and singing, followed by a hundred million angels. And later, the whole creation of heaven, earth, and under the earth. First, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down. And that was the typical Jewish way of prayer, showing humbleness before this almighty God. And we read that each one of them had a harp. In Greek, a kitara. That's where we get our word from, guitar. Now, in Jewish culture, the harp was used in the temple service. We read about that in various psalms where it is stated, let's praise God's name with the harp and the lyre and all sorts of other musical instruments. I'm thinking here of, for instance, Psalm 
33 and Psalm 91. But there are too many of these psalms where the harp was used. The Levites also used harps in their ministry and their service in the temple. Now the four living creatures and the 24 elders were also holding bowls full of incense. And the incense, John says, contained all the prayers of God's people. Of all the saints, over all the centuries. Your and my prayers are also in those bowls of incense. In the Old Testament, the altar of incense had a golden molding around it. You can read about that in Exodus 30. In the New Testament, at the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist, his father Zechariah was busy inside with the temple service, burning incense inside the temple when the angel appeared to him. The sweet smell of incense symbolizes prayers rising to God and God accepting these prayers. Now these bowls of incense are directly linked to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and his taking of that scroll. It's directly related. Your and my prayers and the prayers of the saints over all the centuries are directly linked to Jesus taking the scroll. How? Because Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus taught us that way to pray. In other words, Jesus was so serious that his believers, the faithful, the saints, should continually pray for the kingdom that must, be come, that must come and that God's will must be done. And that shows that our prayers since the time of Jesus on earth until now and until eternity are directly linked to those bowls of incense and the taking of the scroll by Jesus Christ. The four living creatures and the 24 elders sang a new song. This is a symbol from the Old Testament, like Psalm 33 and Psalm 91 and 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation. Did you hear that? Proclaim his salvation day after day. The new song symbolizes three things. The number three is the divine number. First, they sang of the worthiness of the Lamb. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. Second, they sang about the salvation brought about by Jesus, by that sacrifice. They say, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. The purchase price was Jesus' blood on that cross. Revelation uses this expression of persons from every tribe and language and people and nation, guess what? Seven times. And the number of seven is the number of perfection. Everyone from every tribe and nation and tribe and language will be saved. And that is what they sang about. But thirdly, 
They sang of their reign on earth with Christ. Listen, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. And they will reign on the earth. Christ is the sovereign ruler. And we, we will rule with him. Isn't that wonderful? But we can do so now already. We don't have to wait for the day in eternity. We can now already rule with him. We can rule over sin by exercising proper self-control by saying to the Satan, go away Satan. We can rule in this world by letting our Christian voices come true, that we are heard in government, that we are heard in society. We are now already ruling with Christ. This was the song of the four living creatures and the 24 elders. That was the first song. And then a second song broke out. John heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and he even says 10,000 times 10,000. They were all singing. There were angels everywhere. 10,000 times 10,000 is a hundred million. Figuratively, there were angels wherever John looked. An awesome sight. Can you imagine a hundred million angels singing at the top of their voices? In a loud voice, it must have been absolutely overwhelming. This song also sings of the worthiness of the Lamb. He sacrifice and says that he had been slain. And that is why he is worthy to receive the scroll and to open its seals. But it also speaks of seven things that will be the result of that sacrifice. He will receive the power, the wealth, and the wisdom, and the strength, and the honor, and the glory, and the praise. Seven things. The divine number of completeness, of perfection. He will receive everything perfectly. And then, then yet a third song broke out. And this time, not by the elders, or the 24 elders, or, or the, the, the four living creatures, not by the angels, but by every creature in the whole universe of heaven and earth and under the earth. And they sang the praise and honor and glory and power of Christ forever and ever. And they do not only sing in honor of the Lamb, they also sing in honor and praise of the one on the throne, God the Father. The four living creatures, after this third song, they answered by falling down again, saying, Amen. And that means it is true and certain. All these things that everyone sang, the 24 elders, the four living creatures, the angels, the universe, Amen. And they worshipped God. Now, brothers and sisters, are you ready to start singing? Are you ready to join the choir? Start practicing for heaven's choir. 
Remember, God gave the scroll to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our Savior, the Lion Lamb, and Heaven's Song, the third point, should fill our hearts day by day.